Chapter 36, Obstetric and Gynecological Emergencies. To start off with, we need to review our anatomy and physiology. As always, additional information can be found in your textbook along with illustrations and much more detail. The external genitalia consists of the labia, which are protective flaps of skin over the vaginal opening. You have the peritoneum, the skin between the vaginal opening and the rectal opening. And then you have the mon pubis, the skin that covers the front of the pelvis bone directly above the vaginal opening. The internal genitalia consists of the vagina, which is the birth canal. It's a smooth muscle, which is a, able to expand and contract as needed to uh, facilitate delivery of the, the baby. The ovaries and fallopian tubes provide the starting point for the pregnancy. The ovaries develop the ovum, which is released into the fallopian tubes. Typically, fertilization occurs in the fallopian tubes, and the ovum Will travel through the fallopian tube to the uterus. If for some reason the ovum implants in the fallopian tube itself, then that's what's considered an ectopic pregnancy and becomes a emergency that we need to work with. The primary organ used during the growth of the fetus is the muscular uterus. It's a hollow organ located midline in the woman's lower abdominal quadrants. Typically, it's about the size of a fist under normal circumstances. Once the fertilized ovum is implanted and starts to develop into a fetus, the uterus can expand to a very large size so that it accommodates the growing fetus. As the fetus gets larger, the uterus takes over more and more of the abdominal cavity, causing uh, discomfort and uh, other symptoms that we're going to find out about as uh, we assess our patient. To keep uh, the fetus inside the uterus, we have the cervix. It's a muscular ring that kind of keeps everything tight and uh, secure in the uterus until the de uh, delivery is imminent. Once the ovum is released from the ovaries, this process, it also releases estrogen and progesterone. This uh, causes the uterine wall to thicken. If a fertilized egg reaches the uterus, it can cause a implantation of that uh, fertilized egg into the walls of the uterus. If this does not happen, the uterine walls are expelled in your typical menstrual cycle. This lasts typically three to five days. If the sperm reaches the ovum, it becomes an embryo. As the embryo travels past through the fallopian tubes into the uterus, the implantation occurs and it starts to develop uh, into a fetus that usually occurs during the first eight weeks. As the fetus grows within the, the mother's uterus, certain physiological changes start to occur in the body as it adjusts to the the, the need to support the development of a fetus. Typical pregnancy is 40 weeks or nine months. We divide that into three trimesters. We use that for determining what kind of symptoms we might have based on the, the uh, what's occurring in the mother at the time. Placenta is that organ that connects the fetus to the uterine wall. Uh, gas exchange, oxygen, nutrients, waste product. It's connected through the umbilical cord, so we have transfer of all the necessary body fluids and uh, nutrients into the fetus from the mother. The umbilical cord allows circulation. It does come out with the kid, kiddo when they're born and with the placenta. To keep the kid uh, nice and comfortable as it sits in uh, the you, uh, uterus for the next nine months, you have the amniotic sac. This is a uh, nice cushioning fluid that, f that allows the fetus to float around inside the uterus and provides uh, warmth and uh, nutrition for the child. Here you can see how the placenta attaches to the uterine wall 
provides that uh, nutritional connection to the mother. Uh, there's very high capillary count through this little wall here. Typically, it's on the upper side of the uterus. If it does uh, form on the lower side, that's an issue that we're going to have to deal with during pregnancy, uh, during the delivery process. You also see as the uterus increases with the size, it does put pressure on the bladder. And that's why one of the common symptoms of pregnancy is frequent urination. As the fetus grows, the cardiovascular system has to increase in size uh, to compensate for having that extra circulatory system in the uh, uterus. You have increased blood volume, the cardiac output, the heart rate increases. Respiratory system has to increase uh, its supply and demand because the demand is going up. The GI system slows down digestion, frequent nausea and vomiting. Mostly this is from putting pressure on the digestive system from the uterus. Hormones being released for to help the development of the fetus also uh, change the ligaments, make them more susceptible to injuries. Because of the, the change in the center of gravity on the mother, there is uh, postural changes causing back pain, balance issues, and it can exacerbate multiple pre-existing medical conditions. So considering the mother might have uh, diabetes, just the diabetes during pregnancy becomes a more, uh, greater concern. As you can see here, the center of gravity has changed drastically. So uh, balance is becoming an issue. We do also have to worry about supine hypotensive syndrome. The placenta, the infant, and the amniotic fluid is uh, quite heavy. It's 20 to 25 pounds. When the patient is laying supine, this weight compresses on the inferior vena cava, decreasing the cardiac output. This is putting pressure on the vena cava, keeping the blood from going back into the right side of the circulatory system, causes a drop in blood pressure. Very simple to fix for us in a pre-hospital environment. It just prop up the right side of your patient. It shifts the uterus a little bit off center and takes it off of the vena cava. So labor and delivery, it's not as scary as it sounds. What we wanna do is get you comfortable so that you can perform this delivery as if it was your, you've done it every day. Uh, we don't some, want somebody that's scared once they walk in. We want somebody that's willing to jump in there and help the mom deliver. Moms have been delivering babies for centuries without any help. We're just there to guide along the way and provide assistance if needed. First stage of labor starts with the regular contractions and ends with the cervical dilation. Once the cervix is dilated to at least 10 centimeters, then the baby has the option to come out. Second stage of labor is when the baby enters the birth canal and until delivery. Third stage, the baby is born, resuscitation and uh, cleaning of the baby is happening, and then the afterbirth, uh, the placenta is delivered. So in first stages of labor, you have sometimes you have Braxton Hitz contractions. These are regular contractions that are not uh, part of a normal childbirth process. Moms typically have these two or three weeks before the actual delivery. It's just a practice run with the uterus, doing occasional contractions to make sure everything's working right. As the mom gets closer to delivery, the fetus turns its head towards the bottom, uh, towards the uh, birth canal, getting ready to come out. And then you start having contractions of the uterus and they will have labor pains lasting 30 seconds to a minute and gradually getting closer and closer together. Labor pains, uh, we typically measure them on the length of contraction and then we measure from the start to the start for the spacing of the contraction. So we need to know the duration and the frequency. When they last 30 seconds to a minute and are two to three minutes apart, be prepared for delivery. That's one of our, our clues right there. We also have the uh, breaking of the amniotic sac uh, or the, the breaking of the water. 
if for some reason the baby has been stressed during the pre-delivery stages, they may have had a fecal movement within the amniotic fluid. This will be considered meconium staining, and that means the baby's going to need a little bit more aggressive resuscitation when it's born. It's totally uh, doable pre-hospital, but we want you to be aware of it. The second stage of labor occurs when the cervix is fully dilated. Contractions increase in frequency and severity. A mom will complain the pain is getting more and more intense because the contractions are lasting longer and there's getting less break between. Moms will also say they have the urge to push. So as you can see in the diagram here, the birth canal is located directly in uh, contact with the upper side of the rectum. Mom will feel the, the baby coming through the vag vaginal opening and pushing pressure on the rectum and they'll have that urge to have a bowel movement. To do everything you can to keep the mom from going to the, the restroom without your assistance. Uh, you do not want to be delivering a baby from a toilet, so it's best just to clean up mom if something happens. Typically there's not any fecal matter, but it's just the urge. So as with we've learned in trauma, we're going to have to make some decisions fairly quick. Do I load and go or stay and play? We're going to do a real good history on mom to determine whether this is the first pregnancy, or first live birth, or whether it's the 10th, and then how far apart the contractions are, if there are any known complications planned. Other things that are going to come into play to kind of give us an idea where we need to do this delivery. Our goal is to do the delivery in the safest place, that's either in the house somewhere that's calm and uh, easy to work with or at the hospital. We prefer not to do this in the ambulance if at all possible. Third stage of labor is the delivery of the placenta. So the baby's been delivered, mom's going to relax for a little bit, then start having contractions again, and that is the uterus trying to expel the placenta. It's going to start breaking away those capillaries from the uterine wall, the placenta is going to start uh, being delivered 10 to 15 minutes after the fact. Uh, it's it's going to be one of those you can deliver it in the ambulance if you have to, but it's preferred to do it before you leave the scene if possible. Once it's delivered, then we have to worry about contracting the uterus. Typically, moms will release pitocin while they're post-delivery, but you can also increase the release of pitocin by asking mom to nurse the baby or we can do a fundal massage. So we'll uh, discuss that when our, we're talking about post-delivery resuscitation. Patient assessment is one of those key skills that we have to perfect while we're dealing with uh, mothers, uh, patients in the active delivery process. We want to get them to the comfort level that we can walk up to them Hi, I'm Ken. I'm an EMT. I need to make sure you're okay. Let me see your crotch and check for crowning. Got to break that barrier down real quick and get comfortable. So we need to start uh, always always doing your ABCs. Get some past medical history. See if there's any uh, prenatal care, if they have any cautions or concerns based on the prenatal care. If they know their due date, what is their due date? How far, how close are we to that due date? The closer the more likely we're going to be delivering pre-hospital. Is it their first pregnancy? First pregnancy labor can take hours on hours. So we want to make sure we're, we know where we are in this pregnancy stage. Uh, have they seen a doctor about the pregnancy? Have they been giving them regular updates and care? So they start these questions, get some good information on it. We also want to know when the labor pains started. How frequently are they happening? How long are they these contractions lasting? Did the water break? Was there any odd odors, colors, or any blood in that uh, amniotic fluid? Does the patient feel the urge to push or have valve movements? That's telling us that the fetus has started making its way into the birth canal. At this point, you should be very comfortable with mom. She should be very comfortable with you. And you can say, I need to check for crowning to see if the baby's on the way out or if we have time to get you to the hospital. Have your partner take a set of vitals. That gets everybody familiar with everybody else and gets you prepared for the delivery. So first thing you're going to do, physical exam, is check for crowning. 
You can ask mom if you can expose her, 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 her vaginal opening, see if you see a head starting to come out. If it's anything besides the head, we're going to talk about what to do there, but the simple one is most of the time it's going to be the head. Things that give you a little concern when you're doing your history taking, first is that they've had no prenatal care. Most mothers in our modern society have some form of prenatal care. If they haven't, there's nobody that's been checking to meet, see if there's any potential complications. The other thing we're concerned about is premature delivery. In Colorado, we have a low birth weight uh, standard. Most of our kids are born a little bit below normal weight, so we need to pay attention to that as a, pre a possible premature delivery issues. Uh, labor caused by trauma. That's labor that's not planned. It's not the natural occurrence, but at the time the baby has decided it's time to come. And then multiple births. If there's more than one child coming out, we're going to have a lot more resources on the scene to help take care of those additional births. And they're always going to be low birth weight. So we want to make sure that we're prepare, prepared for any hazards, any changes that come out with that. Other things that tell us there's a problem. If the mom says, hey, yeah, my, my baby is going to be born breech, that's a good reason to get you to the hospital. Uh, placenta previa. The placenta is actually formed over the cervix. That presents a hazard uh, that you cannot get the baby delivered other than through C-section. That's not a deliverable. Or the breech presentation. The, the child's not turned around correctly. Either the foot comes out first, the butt comes out, or one of the arms. You really need to be really comfortable with mom and have her comfortable enough with you that you can ask the question, have you had any drug use? We're not there to be cops. We're there to find out what's most dangerous for delivery of the baby. So we want to ask those questions to make sure that we know if there's any narcotics or any uh, cocaine, any hallucinogens, anything that mom has taken, even uh, alcohol, can cause us problems. And again, asking if there's any meconium in the water uh, when the water broke. So normal childbirth, like I said, mom's been doing it for hundreds of years, thousands of years without problems. Most of the time it's a BLS skill, so it's just you catching the baby when it comes out. It's really simple. Mom does all the work. You just got to coach her along and make sure the kid doesn't come out too fast and everything will be good. So your role is to catch. You want to Make sure you don't let the kid come out too fast because if it comes out too fast, just pops. Um, primary role is to determine whether the delivery can happen at the scene or at the hospital. Like I said, the ambulance is kind of tight and it's hard to do a good delivery there. So we prefer to do it at home or in the hospital. So if you're going to do it on scene, first you need to control the scene. Mom, this is a sensitive time for mom and the family, so keep everybody away that you can. Keep everybody in that mom wants there. So make sure that uh, we're, we're using the best crowd control. Wear your proper PPE. At minimum, you're going to be wearing gloves, a mask, and some type of eye protection. If you've got the mask that has the eye shield built into it, that's even better. But as long as you've got something over your face, over your eyes, and your P, uh, BSI on your hands, you should be good. Put the mom on something that's nice and comfortable, the bed, the floor, the ambulance stretcher, something that's comfortable for mom at least. Remove clothing that's obstructing the vagina, take the pants off, take everything off because you're gonna be delivering the baby, you don't want anything in the way. Get your partner at the head, giving mom support, holding her hand, checking vitals as needed, and then pop open your OB kit. Every ambulance has an OB kit. You should have one close by. If, in case you have to deliver, it'll have all the stuff you need. And then keep the environment as warm as possible. If you can, turn up the heat in the ambulance. If you're in the ambulance, if you're in the, the house, turn up the heat a little bit. Keep mom comfortable. Okay, here's the contents of most every OB kit. You're gonna have 
your bulb syringe for suctioning the airway. You'll have your scissors for cutting the umbilical cord. A little hat right here so you can keep the kid's head warm. You got your umbilical clamps and some tape. You got your gloves, some uh, towels, chucks, 4x4s for cleaning things up. You've got uh, sanitary napkins for keeping the, the kid uh, mom comfortable and clean afterwards. Then you've got a bag to put the placenta in or any uh, tissue. The one thing they don't have here that you want to make sure you have is a silver swaddler and towels. Plenty of towels because you want to keep the kid as clean and dry as possible and keep them warm. And the silver swaddler is going to look like a little Chipotle wrapper. You wrap the kid up, it's got a little hoodie to put on him and keeps him nice and warm for you. So if you're off duty and you run across this situation, there are some alternatives. Lots of sheets and towels, shoelaces, twine, something heavy that you can tie off the umbilical cord. The clamps are awesome, but if you don't have them, you need to have some way to contain or to stop the bleeding through the blood flow through the umbilical cord. A towel or a plastic bag to keep the placenta in. This is a good time to mention that some cultures have some uh, desire to may, uh, keep the placenta. Uh, they either do it for a ceremonial reason or health reasons. Please explain to the, 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 the family that you do need to take it to the hospital for, so they can do a pathological exam on it, but they will definitely give it back to them after the fact. You also need to have your PPE, so some gloves and eyewear, and then something to put over the kid's head. I've seen people use socks. It's not the cleanest option, but it's an option for you. So assisting delivery. You want to get mom with her legs up so you can see the vaginal opening. You can kind of watch what's going on there. Tell mom it's going to be uncomfortable. If it's not the first baby, she'll know what's coming. But you need to make sure you're there, you're supportive, provide that emotional support, tell her she's doing a good job. If she doesn't have the dad there or a husband or some other uh, friend to help her, that's where your partner comes in. They need to talk to the mom, help them uh, uh, get accustomed to what's going on. You need to communicate what's going on when you need her to push and when you need her to stop. So we need to be able to have that good relationship build up real quick. So you've got your partner or someone with the mom at the head. Take your gloved hand, put it over the vaginal opening so you can kind of control the, 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 the head coming out so we don't have an explosive birth. The, the danger with that is because the bones of the skull are not completely formed yet and not connected, they will spring when the baby comes out and cause bruising to the baby's head. It's typically not a, a, a danger to the baby, but it is a, a concern that we can, can take care of. So as the baby comes out, you want to keep at least one hand on it. Do not drop the baby. If you drop the baby, it's real important to pick it up. If you notice that as the baby comes out, there's still a, a membrane around the face. You can use your finger to pull on it and see if it's the amniotic, flu, amniotic sac. You want to pull that away and you can pull it apart with your hands or it's fairly easy to pull and tear apart away from the kid and then slide the kid out of it. Once the head's delivered, you want to run your fingers around the neck and see if there's any uh, the umbilical cord wrapped around the neck by chance. If it is, it's real simple to kind of pull it out a little bit and work it out around the head of the baby to get it out from around the head. If you can't get it completely around the head, you can always put clamps on it and then cut between the two clamps. Very important to remember, cut between the clamps and then continue with the deliver. Uh, that's called a nuchal cord if you're taking notes on that one. Uh, once the baby's out, you drop it down and get the top shoulder out and then you lift it up to get the bottom shoulder out and the baby should come out just fine keeping the baby supported. Once it's out, you want to suction the mouth and nose, clean the mouth out, clean the nose out, and the baby should start breathing on its own. If it doesn't, then we go a little bit more aggressive, dry it off, flick the feet, rub the back, and most of your babies will start crying by then. You want to document the time, so you can document that with the, uh, the birth certificate. 
Make sure that gets into your patient care reports so they know how to uh, give the baby proper time and date of birth. As you can see here, we're taking the baby out. You've got the back pressure. You've got pressure on the uterus, on the, uh, the baby's head. Be careful that you, you don't push on the soft spots. And then you've got a hand on the lower to catch the face as it comes out. Once the baby comes out, it turns sideways and you pop the top shoulder out. And then the bottom shoulder pops out and the baby slides out from there. Typically, this is a very quick process. Once the shoulders get out, the baby just kind of slides on out for us. Take him out, clean him up, fat suction the mouth, the nose, and then get him breathing. Once the mom delivers, continue to reassess. Check for life threats. Uh, you want to make sure mom's doing okay. It can, there could be a significant amount of blood loss, so we need to keep an eye on the mom for any type of hypovolemic issues. Make sure we provide good emotional support and take care of any life threats we find. So let's talk about the neonate. What do we do after delivery for the baby? We'll get that, then we'll talk about mom, and then we'll move on to complications. So the neonate, we're assessing immediately after birth. We're checking ABCs. Make sure they're breathing, their heart's going, uh, we're making sure they get good perfusion. The one thing we've got is a, a thing called the APCAR score. We want to do this at one and five minutes. And it's, it's an acronym. It's appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiratory effort. This is a chart in your book. There's typically a chart in your OB kit. There's one in almost every... EMT field guide that you can pick up. But for testing purposes for National Registry and your unit tests, you probably need to memorize it or at least have a really good understanding that you could uh, work your way through it if you need it. The APCAR score first looks at appearance. You want to see if the whole body is pink. They get a two. If the core is pink, but the extremities are blue, then they get a one, and if everything's cyanotic or pale, they get a zero. Pulse greater than 100 is two. Pulse less than 100 is one, and no pulse is zero. Grimace or reflex irritability, how much they fight you. Sneezes, coughs, or a vigorous cry gets a two. Grimaces, just kind of not happy, gets a one, and no response is a zero. The activity, the muscle tone, are they, do they pull against you when you pull on an extremity? Very active, they get a two. Arms and legs are flexed but not pushing really hard, they get a one. And no activity, they get a zero. Respirations, good strong cry, they get a two. Gasping, irregular breathing, they get a one. And absent, they get a zero. So it's very important that we keep the baby warm. We're going to dry it off as soon as possible, wrap it in a towel. This is a good chance to swaddle it up with a nice warm blanket, put the silver swaddler on it, get rid of the wet blankets, put them, put some new clean ones on, and keep the kid as, as good as possible, as warm as possible. Once you have, get the kid covered up, put the little hat on, encourage mom to start breastfeeding. That's going to release the Pitocin, which will help with, help with contraction of the uterus and reduce the uh, threat of bleeding. You ever seen a newborn? They typically come out very wet, covered with all kinds of uh, fluids. You want to dry them off, get them warmed up, give them to mom. It also makes a better presentation of the kids clean, makes mom feel better. So cutting the cord. Most of the time you cut the cord when it's out of the, the, the baby is out, relaxed, everything's good, the baby's breathing on their own. Occasionally, if you have the nuchal cords, you may have to slip it over the head, cut it or cut it between the clamps, and then otherwise wait till it stops stops uh, pulsating. Check with your local protocols and make sure you're following that and everybody's good. 
You can also allow the dad to cut the cord if they like. Just make sure they cut between the clamps. So keep the kid warm. Use sterile clamps. One about 10 inches from the baby, another 7 inches. We want to leave a good tail on the kid's uh, umbilical cord. They can't use that in the NICU to uh, establish IVs. They can also save the cord for uh, stem cells. There's a lot of options there. So we want to give them a 7 to 10 inch uh, cord left on the baby and then a clamp a little bit farther and cut between. Made to notice that I've said cut between multiple times here because that has been an issue I've seen. Cut the cord between the clamps. Uh, don't cut the baby. That's very bad form. So place the baby on the abdomen or uh, let mom start breastfeeding. Typically kids know exactly what to do so you just got them in the general vicinity and they will latch on and start breastfeeding on their own. So here's an illustration of cutting the cord. Making sure the kid is uh, far enough away from your scissors so you don't accidentally cut the kid. Once the kid is out, start drying him, making sure you're cleaning him up. 30 seconds at least, usually more. Uh, if they are not breathing over 60 times a minute, you want to start helping them breathe. Get the back valve mask out, so little puffs of oxygenation, oxygenated air in there. And that will help them perk up quite a bit. Here shows rubbing the back, flicking the feet. We do not do any butt slaps anymore. And we don't shake the babies to try to get them to breathe. So you want to rub the back, flick the feet, get them stimulated, and kiddos do just fine. If the heart rate's less than 100, you need to start using your BBM. Kiddos, the heart rate is typically well above 100 when they're born. If it's less than 60, we're going to start chest compressions. And with a neonate, this is not a child, infant, this is a neonate, you're going to do compressions at least 120 times a minute. And you're going to do three to one. So it's three compressions, circumferential compressions. So you're holding the kid in your fingers, using your thumbs, and you're compressing the chest three and then one breath, three, one breath, one, three, one breath. And it's really fast. Hopefully you never have to do it, but if you do, you know how. Uh, you, if it's over, they're good good ventilations, the breath, pulse rate is over 100, you just keep keeping them dry and keep them moving forward. You may have to stick a, an oxygen tube in their face and blow a little oxygen in there to keep them perked up, but everything should be good from there. Typically, we've used very little advanced care. You can see the majority of the the care we do is drying, warming, and stimulation. That is for like 90% of the kiddos. Occasionally, their pulse is below 100. You just have to do a little positive pressure ventilation, the BVM. Very rare do we need any type of advanced airway. This is one that uh, most ALS providers would prefer to let the NICU staff do because it's a high-risk, low-frequency skill. We very rarely ever need to do it. And if you need to do it, it's probably a really sick kiddo. So we want to make sure that most expert person is there and can take that opportunity to, to take care of the child. Very rare do we use medications. The few times the medication is used is usually a, uh, a baby born with some narcotics on board. And we have to do something to reverse that. Typically, that's a little Narcan dose. Uh, but again, that's much more prevalent in the NICU. So we prefer to leave them at that, leave them to take care of that if, unless it's a life threat. So here's your circumferential compressions. This is a preferred method for infants too now with American Heart. So the hands behind the chest, two thumbs in the center, pushing down one third the depth of the chest at about 120 beats a minute. So care after delivery. What do we do for mom now that we got the kid taken care of? So we need to make sure that mom is uh, delivering the placenta. Once the placenta is delivered, we need to clean mom up, get her comfortable, get the kid nursing and try to start contractions or uh, contractions of the uterus so that we can actually control that bleeding. We also want to do a fundal massage. We're going to take one hand and put it right over the symphysis pubis 
and kind of push down really deep and try to kind of block off the vaginal opening with one hand and the other hand you're going to reach in the belly and you're going to find the uterus in there it's going to feel like a, a deflated uh, volleyball and you're going to rub it between any moms that's had this done was are, will definitely tell you it's not pay it's not pain free but it's it serves a really important uh, purpose you try to get that full contraction the other thing you're going to help mom do is clean up get comfortable uh, she's going to have worked really hard for the last several hours so you're going to give her uh, some cool washcloths to clean her up make her feel good wrap her up in nice clean blankets get the rid of the wet chucks underneath her give her something nice and warm to sit on and take care of mom when the afterbirth is born you're going to have uh, labor pains just the same uh, it's going to come out if it hasn't happened in 20 minutes consider driving to the hospital with your patient it's not that difficult to deliver in the ambulance it just provides a, a large amount of blood which is going to cause a, a biohazard issue in the back of the ambulance for you but uh, it, it's not undoable there's a placenta being delivered it's a uh, just a massive tissue coming out do not pull on the umbilical cord and try to pull it out it will come out when it's ready if you try to pull you actually invert the uterus and bring the uterus out too that is a, a bad thing so here's the controlling the bleeding your sanitary napkin do not uh, pack the vagina do the fundal massage and have mom nurse the baby there's a picture of the uh, fundal massage it's a pretty intense painful massage but most moms have been prepped for it by their OBs vital signs be nice wipe the hands and feet the face cool them off get rid of everything else all right let's talk about some complications that we may run into during delivery common complications we talked about the nuchal cord the cord around the neck we talked about the unbroken the amniotic sac that's easy you pull it out do not use a scalpel or scissors you need to make sure it's really the sac some infants you have to do a little bit of encouragement to help them breathe if we want to uh, rub their back rub their feet dry them up aggressively and they'll perk up just fine one complication we can most of the time deliver pre-off pre-hospital uh, buttocks or leg both legs first delivery easy to work with not too difficult to deliver pre-hospital the butt buttocks breach or the frank breach is fairly easy because the legs are bent up at the hip and so your feet are actually by the ears and so when it comes out the butt comes out the kid slides out a little bit more complicated but as the kid's neck goes past the cervix it doesn't get tight down around the neck because you get the feet protecting it if it's a footly breach that provides a little bit more complication for us so as the kid comes out we're going to have the cervix cross go past the shoulders go down on the neck and then makes the head far harder to get out so one the trick we do with that is take your hand and put it on the chest of the the kiddo slide your fingers up until you feel the face and you can hold the 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 cervix around the neck out so that you can get the head out so don't uh, try to pull the baby out by the legs that's a bad thing mom needs a little oxygen head down pelvis up put a pillow behind the butt so that you can slow down the process so if it uh, it does come out it's not going to be explosive and then just take care of everybody like it would do a normal delivery one thing if you've got one foot coming out you can always reach up in the vaginal opening and see if you can find the other foot just stuck in there and if you don't find the other foot it's probably one leg down and one leg up as it was a breech position so the kid will come out doing the splits but it's still giving you protection of the cervix on the neck so there's a the footly breech notice the the hand on the back there trying to keep the cervix off the neck 
limb presentation, uh, footlings, that's easy. Get the feet out, protect the, the neck from the cervix and get the head out. If it's an arm breach, kid's not coming out. There's no way he's going sideways. If a prolapse cord, you got to be careful because the cord is actually getting pressed on the wall of the vagina by the kiddo as he's passing through, tamponading flow, but he's not out where he can breathe yet. So uh, very simple, very uh, important that we get those to the hospital. Uh, limb reach, head down, pelvis elevated. Put a do not place a gloved hand unless there's a prolapse cord. If there's a prolapse cord, you are going to stop the mom from delivering and you're going to keep her uh, calm, try not to push and deliver, get the baby to the hospital. So you're going to put the hand in there and push the baby back and take the pressure off the cord. Uh, get to the hospital and they'll do a C section and uh, they will take care of the kid from there. So you see on the footling breach, not too bad of a deal. Arm breach, shake the kid's hand and say, let's go to the hospital. You're, he's not coming out no matter what. So you're going to get that one for a C-section. If they have the prolapse cord, if you look for crowning and all you see is a cord hanging out, we want to make sure we get mom from, stop her from pushing as hard as she would on normal because that's going to put more pressure on the cord. Needed to get the kiddo to the hospital so they can do a C-section. So you're going to push it, mom with the head down, pelvis raised, or the alternative way is put her face down on the cot with the, the buttocks elevated, so up on her knees. So she can grab the cot face down, grab where her head would go on the cot, hold on, buckle her in, and then you're going to insert a gloved hand into the vaginal opening and push the baby off the cord. As you're doing this, you want to get mom to quit pushing. It's really hard because mom wants to push. She's having contractions. So you have to get her to calm down. Best way is tell her, act like she's blowing out candles every time she has a contraction. So she's just huffing, breathing that air out. You can also say, play it like a dog. Uh, so you get her strapped on the cot, caboose up in the air, pant like a dog, and you're pushing the baby back in, and you're driving as fast as possible in a controlled speed using due regard, get to the hospital where they can do a C-section. Please let the hospital know you're coming because they will be shocked when you walk in in that position. Here's the prolapse cord. See it's going to be pushing against the cord as it comes out, so we want to protect every precaution to keep the kid from coming out. Multiple births. Again, that's going to be a, a problem for us because we have one patient that turns into three, four patients. Everybody's going to be delivered at a different time and you're going to have to do resuscitation on each one because they're probably going to be low birth weights. So do everything you can, get all the help you need, and then just take care of them as you would any other birth. Keep them warm, keep the airways clean, do resuscitation as needed. Don't get it contaminated and please let the hospital know. They like to call themselves emergency departments, but when you show up with an emergency and don't give a warning, they get kind of nervous. Mercodium staining, it's kind of green, yeah, brownish color. Do not get the kid breathing until you actually get some suction on, because if you suck or if they breathe before you get a good suction on, they're going to suck that into the lungs. And that's going to cause, cause some pneumonias and some other complications. So open the airway, clean the airway very securely, uh, lots of suction, and then do ventilations and transport. These typically are a little bit bigger babies, but they end up in the NICU. So you'll have a 10-pound baby in with the uh, preemies that are 3 or 4 pounds. So it's kind of fun to watch them when they're in the NICU, but... And again, it's it's dangerous. So other emergencies we may may run across here. Pre-birth bleeding. Control the bleeding as much as possible. Get them to the hospital. Ectopic pregnancy. We've talked about lower abdominal pain, childbearing ages, possibility of pregnancy, seizures during pregnancy or eclampsia. 
we control the seizure, we take care of mom, make sure everything's good. Then we have uh, miscarriages and abortions, trauma in pregnancies. Remember, you've got you need to save the mom before you can save the baby. Stillbirths and then cardiac arrests in pregnant women. So we're going to talk a little bit more detail about these. Excessive pre-birth bleeding is that placenta previa. It's where the placenta forms across the birth canal. Uh, they can cause bleeding as the cervix starts to dilate, but this is truly a fire code violation. They block the only exit out of the uterus. And so you need to take them to the hospital, to a C-section, and then call the fire marshal to make sure we uh, get them cited for that. The abrupto placenta is when it starts tearing apart from the uterine wall prematurely. Typically, it's a blow to the belly, uh, some type of trauma, deceleration trauma. They can have massive bleeding into the uterus with occasional bleeding uh, from the vagina because you have that opening and the cervix lets it out. Have profuse bleeding, abdominal pain, signs of shock. You want to give them oxygen transport. Sanitary napkin and get them to the hospital. If there's anything discharged, you want to save it so they can do examination at the hospital and see what it is. But again, that's your priority is saving mom right now. Ectopic pregnancy, you're going to have abdominal pain, usually just one-sided, lower abdominal quadrants. Typically have some vaginal bleeding, signs of shock. And no last menstrual cycle. Seizures during pregnancy, they typically start off with a preeclampsia. They're, uh, they have excessive uh, body weight. They have uh, edema. Their muscles are hypersensitive. They have hypertension. It's usual uh, excessive weight gain, swelling. They swell up like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Altered mental status, uh, very uh, high uh, or uh, very active reflexes. If they go into a seizure, it's because that's when they turn into eclampsia. Miscarriages and abortion, they can be spontaneous or induced. They can be intentional or unintentional. Uh, typically, it's a uh, severe cramping, abdominal pains. They're having contraction of the uterus as the, it expels the fetus. It's typically well, well before the fetus is viable. So you'll have uh, bleeding, you'll have discharge. Save all the tissue that's discharged and take it to the hospital with you. You wanna obtain vital signs, treat for shock, place a napkin over the vaginal opening, transport. Transport everything with you. This is typically an emotional time for mom because they thought they were going to have a full-term pregnancy and now they're having a miscarriage. And so you have to provide that extra emotional support for the, the mom and the family as you go. Trauma during pregnancy, we're more concerned with, we're, we're mainly concerned with taking care of mom. Uh, they're not going to show signs of shock as soon, or as soon as others because they've already got an elevated blood uh, pulse rate so they're not going to have that increased pulse rate like you would on a normal trauma they have an increased blood volume so their their volume has has a lot of extra in it so they can lose a lot before they actually show symptoms so we want to be very cautious and treat mechanism a lot on these and get be, be on the air of uh, caution the, and treat them as if they have the, the potential for severe hypovolemia before we even show signs. Stillbirths, something happened during the pregnancy where the fetus did not stay viable till full term. Most of the time in the early stages, that's the miscarriage. If it goes to full term or gets almost a full term, you may have a delivery that is not viable and it will be very obvious when the uh, the, the fetus is, uh, comes out. Give lots of emotional support to the family. If you think there's any question, go ahead and do life support. Do CPR, do ventilations, see what the options are. Talk to your medical control, tell them what's going on and get their advice on the process. Something new with the American Heart is they're pushing a lot for more uh, concern on pregnancy and cardiac arrest. 
if we can do good CPR and keep a good perfusion to the fetus as well as the mom, we could save one or two of the patients were involved. So if it's over 20 weeks, we're going to pay, uh, lift one side of the patient so that we move the uterus off the vena cava. Remember the postural hypotension? We're going to try to get the fetus off of the vena cava so we get good flow back to the heart, increase our preload, and get better compressions. Also because the uterus is pushing on the diaphragm the heart sits a little bit higher in the chest so we're going to go a little bit higher on the sternum and do compressions there are lots of cases where we've done cpr on a uh, expectant mother managed to save the fetus even though mom was not viable so take every opportunity you can to try to save the mom but uh, knowing you're you're also providing an opportunity for the kiddo inside so other gynecological problems we might run into uh, that are not uh, pregnancy related. Most of these are going to be uh, some type of a uh, vaginal bleed, abdominal pain, just uh, could be trauma, could be uh, pay, uh, painful menstruation, could be excessive menstruation, but we have vaginal bleeding with potential for blood loss. So we treat those just for shock. Could have trauma to the external genitalia. Look for the mechanism. Could be a, a fall, could be an assault, something hit in the groin area. If it's enough to cause damage to the external, consider damage to the internal and look for uh, any types of hypovolemia. Patients have been exposed to sexual assault. First, we got to take our ABCs into consideration. We always want to make sure we take care of any life threats we found. If there are no life threats or if we can do anything possible to preserve any evidence, we want to do that for our patient. We want to help them take care of the problem that happened, keep them alive, and make sure we take uh, give the officers everything they need to further the investigation. So we only uh, examine genitalia if we have potential life threats. We want to encourage our patients to not go take a shower, take a bath, avoid any restroom or cleaning the wounds, and then know your local mandated reporting requirements, what's required. Uh, best thing you do is say, I don't feel safe on the scene. I need law enforcement for my assistance here. And then they will take it from there because once they're on scene, they use the plain sight doctrine, they don't have to have warrants, and they can actually address everything easier that way. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Hopefully it helps you on your journey to become an EMT. Please like and subscribe and let me know in the comments how you're doing on your class and if you have any questions. Thanks and have a great day.